Hello and um, thank you for watching this presentation. My name is Stefan Licher and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Japanese Studies at Heidelberg University. And today I would like to consider the very complex, I hope I will be able to show, relationship between Zen and the esoteric Buddhist teachings during the pre-modern period. Now, I shan't simply restate what I've already written in my paper. There, I've traced the problem of the relationship between the Tantric sovereign Mahavairojana and the all-too-human progenitor of the Zen lineage, Shakyamuni Buddha, from the perspective of the doctrine of the Dharmakaya breaching the law. And I conclude that at least one strand of Japanese Zen from the very beginning was actually the Zen of Mahavairojana. Today, in this presentation, on the other hand, I would like to consider the complex relationships of Zen and esoteric Buddhism from a somewhat different but still related angle. And I will actually begin with the very example with which I have closed my paper. And maybe the most straightforward way to get to the heart of what I would like to talk about today is to ask, does Bodhidharma's nose preach the Dharma? Now, let us ponder this conundrum in the time-honored fashion of actually taking up a koan, namely the fifth case of the woman Guan, which, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, runs as follows. It's like a man up in a tree, hanging from a branch with his mouth, his hands can't grasp a bow, his feet won't reach one. So under the tree there is another man, and he asks the first man about the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West. Now, if the man hanging in the tree doesn't answer, he evades his duty. If he does answer, he loses his life. So, what should he do? How are we to make sense of such a story? In fact, to ask how to make Zen make sense is to put ourselves into the shoes of very early Japanese Zen practitioners who, just like us, were not used to koan language as a form of religious speech. Hence, to study how pre-modern Buddhist practitioners made koan make sense and why they made them, made them make sense in the way they did, that might actually tell us something very vital about pre-modern Zen as a whole. So, in order to gain a first foothold, as it were, on the meaning of the man stuck in a tree, I would now like to introduce an interpretation or a reading of this koan case which I've taken from a 17th century Koa manual from the Genju faction, which was an important but mostly forgotten Rinzai lineage, or rather collection of lineages. Where to begin? Both of the options presented to the man in the tree, to speak or to stay silent, um, look somewhat unpromising. So let's note that there's actually a second puzzle nested in the first, namely the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West. Perhaps we can start from here. So, surely it's important that Bodhidharma came from the West, not the East, the South or North. And the West, according to Chinese associative cosmology, is the direction of the metal element, which is associated with the lung organ. Now, breath originates from the lungs and flows in and out of the nose. Bodhidharma, as an Indian from the West, has a big fat nose. And therefore, Bodhidharma's nose must be what breaches the Dharma of coming from the West. But what is this Dharma coming from the West? Now, let us dwell a little bit longer on the patriarch's prominent proposals. As Kohan Shushin's Tsoroku, which is another uh, Genju faction Kohan manual explains, As the breath enters and leaves the body from it, the nose forms first from among the five parts of the body and the six roots. So the nose is the very first organ to form in a new body. Hence, Bodhidharma's big fat nose relates him to the fetus gestating in the womb. And for this reason, Koan also calls him the nose patriarch. The fetus does little but to breathe in and breathe out the nourishing breaths that reach it from the mother's nostrils. And hence, in-breath and out-breath show being and nothingness. They are what is called the meaning of coming from the West. 
So just to breathe, like an unborn child nestled in the womb, is the meaning of Bodhidharma's nose coming from the West. Consequently, when the man in the tree, neither able to speak nor able to remain silent, continues to simply breathe, the promise, yet absence of voice, reverberating in his nostrils, reveals him to be the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West, that is to say, to be dwelling in the womb. And indeed, as a Genju Koa manual states through a scripted dialogue between Zen teacher and student, Master, inviting the student to answer, says, tell me about hanging from a branch by the mouth. The student says, it is like somebody stuck at the milk root in the womb. So, according to the Genju lineage koan materials we've just looked at, the true meaning of the fifth case of the womb and guan is teaching us to return to the breath of the womb. Although so Brutishly physiological a reading of a koan might strike us as strange, for after all, how do we today conceive of the soteriological importance of womb dwelling? This kind of thinking, this way of making sense of Zen, actually was widely spread among late medieval Zen lineages. For example, in the Soto faction, there was transmitted a kirigami or oral transmission document entitled the Zen Montaini Goinozu or char, uh, chart of the five positions in the womb. The five positions are a common framework used in Buddhist and spe specifically Abhidharmic and Tantric materials to discuss human ontogenesis. In the Soto oral transmission, the very image of the fetus dwelling in the womb as a man nestling in a tree is interpreted in the context of these five positions. And the central message of the Zen Montaina Goinozu is that, in the text's own words, on the futon, so sitting in meditation, one dwells like on the lotus seat at the root of the mother's womb. So the main practice of the Zen lineage, formal seated meditation, is to return to dwell in the womb. So ontogenesis, human gestation, as a soteriological ma matrix. Soto and Genjo lineage shared a great deal of materials relating to this motif. So let us consider one final example, a non-classical koan case found in some Genju koan materials. By non-classical here, I mean that the case in question is of Japanese origins and, as far as I know, cannot be found in Chinese Chan materials. Now, the case in question is crow and rabbit fly above the head. In the Genju lineage, this is said to exemplify the relationship between fundamental and acquired wisdom. The key to understanding this koan is to remember that in East Asia, um, the crow and the rabbit are associated with the sun and the moon. The text continues to explain that fundamental wisdom is yin and yang not yet separate, or the pure yin before its division into the two polarities of yin and yang. Acquired wisdom, on the other hand, is the beginning of yang from which the 10,000 things are born. Yin and yang, the text continues, are the sun and moon, the crow and the rabbit. Receiving the yin key of the moon and uh, the yin key, yes, of the moon and the yang key of the sun, the physical body is produced from their unity, from the unity of crows and hairs. And this process is exemplified by the image of a precious jewel that, when it's turned towards the sun, absorbs the heat, and when turned towards the moon, absorbs the cool. So the human body is the kind of non-dual ground that arises from the unity of yin and yang. Now, a Soto Kirigami entitled Shotikai Shichikai Soto Himitsu Shikets encodes the very same structure we have just discussed, but instead of casting it in koan form, it presents it as a chart, of which this is a modern reproduction created by Itsuka Hironobu from Komazawa University. At the upper end of the chart, we see a black half, um, half black and half red circle. Black represents female yin, red male yang. The circle thus represents yin and yang in their original state of non-separation. Immediately beneath the half circle, we have a moon disk, complete with a rabbit on the left, and a sun disk, resplendent with a crow on the right. These two are identified with fundamental wisdom and initial wisdom, respectively. Underneath is drawn a human figure identified as Mount Sumeru, along with other associations. 
The explanatory texts accompanying this chart states that Sumeru is the body born from sun and moon, father and mother. The origin of the seed of all things is born from the two natures of sun and moon, male and female, fire and water. In this Soto chart, the non-classical koan, crow and rabbit fly above the head acquire a very precise graphical meaning. And as these two examples make clear, late medieval Soto and Genju Zen lineages, they operated actually within a shared paradigm of koan interpretation. And according to this paradigm, ontogenesis models the soteriological process, and consequently koan could or even had to be read as guides to the womb. Now, let us cast our nets a little wider though, so that we can try to understand why koan would or should be understood in such a manner. The Kenkon Chin, uh, Kenkon Shasho is a late 16th century text recording a fictional conversation between a teacher and a student on the relationship between Tantric Buddhism and Zen. Although its origin and author are unknown, it gives pride of place to the Tantric teachings and hence likely originated within the Tantric lineage. So it's a Tantric text, or let's assume it's a Tantric text for the sake of this presentation. What is, what is important for our purposes is to note that in this text, it, or that this text is actually virtually contemporary to the Soto and Genju Koan traditions we have just discussed. And one striking feature of the text is that it sometimes uses phrases commonly associated with the Zen lineages, such as transmitting mind with mind, in order to characterize the Tantric teachings. And these tantric teachings it differentiates from Zen on the following grounds. In the Zen faction, they do not establish a teaching on the intermediary state. They do not extol sentient beings in the intermediary state, nor mother and father as the breath of one mind. However, according to the tantric teachings, Buddhas and patriarchs have great compassion in the intermediate state and from it take to the mother's womb. So, the difference between Zen and the Tantric teachings, in other words, is whether they have an embryology of awakening or not. The Kenkon Chinsha show uses a number of frameworks to conceptualize its own Tantric embryology, and importantly, these include both the nasal breath and the unity of Sun Crow or Moon Rabbit that we have encountered in the Zen materials just discussed. So let us consider first the breath. To greatly simplify the um, Ken Kontisha Show's exposition, the basic idea is that breath is closely connected to, or perhaps even identical with, consciousness, as it corresponds not to the wind, but rather to the consciousness element, and hence can be considered the essence of all five physical elements. When mother and father give rise to desire during the appropriate season and their respective seeds mix, then the being awaiting rebirth in the intermediary realm discards its subtle body and writes the breath of the mother into the admixture of parental and, marental and uh, maternal seeds, thereby completing fertilization. According to an alternative account of this process, it's the parent's mixed breath that fulfills this function. Now, the nose or nostrils play an important role in the rebirth of consciousness descent as they provide both the entryway and the endpoints of the passageways that the rebirth of consciousness takes through the mother's body riding the breath into the fertilized seed, which begins, this passageway begins at the mother's nostrils and ends in forming the new beings, the new fetus's own nostrils. So, the first feature of the body to differentiate is the nose and this new body in other words grows from the tip of its nose and in the genju lineage this becomes the patriarchal nose of bodhidharma a similar shared discourse can also be discerned in the ken Shinsha shows exposition of sun and moon as productive forces gestating the human body Immediately hinting at the Zen context, the text develops these motifs referring to the slogan before mother and father are born. Master says, tell me about before mother and father are born. The student answers, 
it's heat and cold. From here, the place of heat and cold united is born the essence of crow and rabbit, male and female, yin and yang. From the intercourse of male and female, the child is born. So, as these, as these examples make clear, to read koan, or at least Zen slogans and teachings, in an embryological framework, a framework that includes the breath, as well as cosmological structures such as sun and moon, was a common practice during the late medieval period, one that was used regardless of lineage affiliation. However, as the presence of such koan readings, as well as the use of Zen slogans in order to define the tantric teachings themselves in a source such as the Ken Konchinsha show, which it's, with its strong tantric connotations suggests, it would be too simplistic to consider these crisscrossing motives in terms of some monodirectional vectors of influence that extend from esoteric Buddhism onto the Zen movement. Rather, it seems that there's something much more sub subtle happening. And this becomes clear once we look at one possible source for such physiological ex expositions of koan, and again we extend our nets even further backwards in time into the 14th or 13th, 14th centuries. Chikot's Daie was a student of Eni, the founder of the influential Shoichi lineage of Zen. Jikotsu authored a commentary on the famous ox herding pictures. And as part of his explication of the eighth vignette, men and ox both forgotten, Jikotsu comments on the famous Chan or Zen slogan, directly pointing at the human heart, seeing nature becoming Buddha. Jikotsu explains that the human heart directly indicated is the heart lump of red flesh, Shakuniku Shindan. The interested Curious Zen practitioner would perhaps casually assume that this reference to a lump of meat is actually an allusion to Linji's famous saying on the true man of no rank, namely that upon your lump of red flesh is one true person. So, in pointing to a red lump of flesh, Chikotsu's exposition appears to be faultlessly mainstream. Except that when speaking of the heart lump of red flesh, Chikots was actually being entirely literal. The heart or mind indicated by Zen, according to Chikots, is precisely the physical, lumpy, meaty organ in the chest. And the process by which Chikots arrived at this conclusion is a somewhat tedious and torturous one, but in brief, Chikotsu inherited from his teacher Eni, who besides transmitting Chan teachings was also a Tendai Tantric adept, the axiomatic idea that Zen referred to the inner self-verification of the Tantric deity Mahavairochana. In the Tantric teachings, this inner verification is manifested in Sanskrit seed syllables, especially the syllable A. Zen, on the other hand, is based on the principle of not establishing words and letters. Consequently, according to any, Zen refers to the mind of Mahavairojana before any syllables um, have arisen. Furthermore, ever since Anand, the great systematizer of Tendai Tantric teachings, it's been taken for granted that the Tantric mind of awakening was identical with the heart organ in the chest, the eight fleshy lobes of which turned into the eight petals of a lotus during the tantric process of cultivation. It is on this hard lotus that the syllable A appears, and you see this kind of motif here in the figure on the left. Based on these promised premises, the problem for Chikutsu now was as follows. If Zen does indicate the mind of Mahavairojana before any syllables arise, and if the mind of Mahavairojana has a basis in the physical body, then which part of the body does Zen indicate when indicating mind? And Chikotsu concludes that Zen indicates the heart organ as a simple square piece of meat that is as yet unblossomed into the fleshy lotus and syllable that are the tantric mind. And this, you know, fleshy meat or this lump of meat you can see here on the right side. This interpretation 
arose precisely from Chikotsu's contention, which he shared with the much later Ken Konchinja show, that Zen was a teaching without a Buddha. That is to say, a teaching that did not touch upon the gestation of a Buddha body in the flesh. Zen, in short, lacked embryology, and hence it had to make do with the physical heart. As the above discussion suggests, the hermeneutical intention of explicating Zen koan or teachings in terms of tantric physiology was not only a common discourse in the late medieval period, it had its origin in the very first generations of Japanese Zen Buddhist practitioners. Try as they tried to make sense of the new form of Buddhism arriving from the continent. Now, in my paper, I more fully explore the doctrinal context from which this way of making Zen make sense arose, specifically the twin discourses on the Dharmakaya teaching and on the Tendai school's own twin commitment to Lotus and Tantric teachings. For now, for this presentation, I would simply to like to suggest two very general points. First, the physiological exposition of Zen should not really come as a surprise to us. Given the importance the body had for tantric teachings and how central and dominant tantric teachings were in pre modern Buddhism. The body simply was the most obvious, most commonly available hermeneutical model during the pre modern period. So, for a pre modern practitioner, it was simple common sense to explicate a koan in terms of the body. And for such a pre-modern practitioner, our own contemporary penchant for reading Zen, for instance, in terms of experience, would, has, would have been as puzzling um, as the, the physiological exposition is for us. And second, and relating specifically to embryological models used in both Zen and Tantric lineages, Chikotsu Dai, although he's today mostly known as a Zen monk, in fact was a key player in the formulation of Tantric embryological teachings as well. Having close context for content, con, having close connections, pardon, for instance, with the Sambuin lineage, which in turn is related to what is known as the infamous Dachi Kavaryu. So, in other words, Zen and Tantric embryologies, or rather the discourses enabling them, originate in the very same circles of practitioners and sometimes in the very same texts. So, medieval Zen and medieval Tantra, to put it perhaps a little provocatively, were co-creations or twin movements. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation and I'm very much looking forward to hearing your comments during the discussions.